Curtains. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Lafaro. Troy, or Ilion, was the capital of a kingdom in Asia Minor, situated near the Hellespont, and founded by Ilus, son of Tros. At the time of the famous Trojan War, this city was under the government of Priam, a direct descendant of Ilus. Priam was married to Hecuba, daughter of Dymus, king of Thrace, and among the most celebrated of their children were the renowned and valiant Hector, the prophetess Cassandra, and Paris, the cause of the Trojan War. Before the birth of her second son Paris, Hecuba dreamt that she had given birth to a flaming brand, which was interpreted by Isaacus, the seer, a son of Priam by a former marriage, to signify that she would bear a son who would cause the destruction of the city of Troy. Anxious to prevent the fulfilment of the prophecy, Hecuba caused her new-born babe to be exposed on Mount Ida to perish. But being found by some kind-hearted shepherds, the child was reared by them, and grew up unconscious of his noble birth. As the boy approached manhood, he became remarkable not only for his wonderful beauty of form and feature, but also for his strength and courage, which he exercised in defending the flocks from the attacks of robbers and wild beasts. Hence he was called Alexander, or Helper of Men. It was about this time that he settled the famous dispute concerning the golden apple, thrown by the goddess of discord into the assembly of the gods. As we have already seen, he gave his decision in favour of Aphrodite, thus creating for himself two implacable enemies, for Hera and Athene never forgave the slight. Paris became united to a beautiful nymph named Sinone, with whom he lived happily in the seclusion and tranquillity of a pastoral life. But to her deep grief, this peaceful existence was not fated to be of long duration. Hearing that some funereal games were about to be held in Troy in honour of a departed relative of the king, Paris resolved to visit the capital and take part in them himself. There he so greatly distinguished himself in a contest with his unknown brothers, Hector and Dephobus, that the proud young princes, enraged that an obscure shepherd should snatch from them the prize of victory, were about to create a disturbance when Cassandra, who had been a spectator of the proceedings, stepped forward and announced to them that the humble peasant who had so signally defeated them was their own brother Paris. He was then conducted to the presence of his parents, who joyfully acknowledged him as their child, and amidst the festivities and rejoicings in honour of their new-found son, the ominous prediction of the past was forgotten. As a proof of his confidence, the king now entrusted Paris with a somewhat delicate mission. As we have already seen in the legend of Heracles, that great hero conquered Troy, and after killing King Leomedon, carried away captive his beautiful daughter, Hesione, whom he bestowed in marriage to his friend Telamon. But although she became princess of Salamis, and lived happily with her husband, her brother Priam never ceased to regret her loss, and the indignity which had been passed upon his house. And it was now proposed that Paris should be equipped with a numerous fleet, and proceed to Greece in order to demand the restoration of the king's sister. Before setting out on this expedition, Paris was warned by Cassandra against bringing home a wife from Greece, and she predicted that if he disregarded her injunction, he would bring inevitable ruin upon the city of Troy, and destruction to the house of Priam. Under the command of Paris, the fleet set sail, and arrived safely in Greece. Here the young Trojan prince first beheld Helen, the daughter of Zeus and Leda, and sister of the Dioscuri, who was the wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta, and the loveliest woman of her time. The most renowned heroes in Greece had sought the honour of her hand, but her stepfather, Tyndareus, king of Sparta, 
fearing that if he bestowed her in marriage on one of her numerous lovers, he would make enemies of the rest, made it a stipulation that all suitors should solemnly swear to assist and defend the successful candidate with all the means at their command, in any feud which might hereafter arise in connection with the marriage. He at length conferred the hand of Helen upon Menelaus, a warlike prince, devoted to martial exercises, and the pleasure of the chase, to whom he resigned his throne and kingdom. When Paris arrived at Sparta, and sought hospitality at the royal palace, he was kindly received by King Menelaus. At the banquet given in his honour, he charmed both host and hostess by his graceful manner and varied accomplishments, and specially ingratiated himself with the fair Helen, to whom he presented some rare and chaste trinkets of Asiatic manufacture. Whilst Paris was still a guest at the court of the king of Sparta, the latter received an invitation from his friend Idomeneus, king of Crete, to join him in a hunting expedition, and Menelaus, being of an unsuspicious and easy temperament, accepted the invitation, leaving to Helen the duty of entertaining the distinguished stranger. Captivated by her surpassing loveliness, the Trojan prince forgot every sense of honour and duty, and resolved to rob his absent host of his beautiful wife. He accordingly collected his followers, and with their assistance stormed the royal castle, possessed himself of the rich treasures which it contained, and succeeded in carrying off its beautiful and not altogether unwilling mistress. They at once set sail, but were driven by stress of weather to the island of Crania, where they cast anchor, and it was not until some years had elapsed, during which time home and country were forgotten, that Paris and Helen proceeded to Troy. Preparations for the war When Menelaus heard of the violation of his hearth and home, he proceeded to Pylos, accompanied by his brother Agamemnon, in order to consult the wise old king Nestor, who was renowned for his great experience and statecraft. On hearing the facts of the case, Nestor expressed it as his opinion that only by means of the combined efforts of all the states of Greece could Menelaus hope to regain Helen in defiance of so powerful a kingdom as that of Troy. Menelaus and Agamemnon now raised the war cry, which was unanimously responded to from one end of Greece to the other. Many of those who volunteered their services were former suitors of the fair Helen, and were therefore bound by their oath to support the cause of Menelaus. Others joined from pure love of adventure, but one and all were deeply impressed with the disgrace which would attach to their country should such a crime be suffered to go unpunished. Thus, a powerful army was collected, in which few names of note were missing. Only in the case of two great heroes, Odysseus, Ulysses, and Achilles, did Menelaus experience any difficulty. Odysseus, famed for his wisdom and great astuteness, was at this time living happily in Ithaca, with his fair young wife Penelope, and his little son Telemachus and was loath to leave his happy home for a perilous foreign expedition of uncertain duration. When therefore his services were solicited, he feigned madness. But the shrewd Palamedes, a distinguished hero in the suit of Menelaus, detected and exposed the ruse, and thus Odysseus was forced to join in the war. But he never forgave the interference of Palamedes, and, as we shall see, eventually revenged himself upon him in a most cruel manner. Achilles was the son of Peleus, and the sea goddess Thetis, who is said to have dipped her son when a babe in the river Styx, and thereby rendered him invulnerable except in the right heel by which she held him. When the boy was nine years old, it was foretold to Thetis that he would either enjoy a long life of inglorious ease and inactivity, or that after a brief career of victory, he would die the death of a hero. Naturally desirous of prolonging the life of her son, the fond mother devoutly hoped that the former fate might be allotted to him. With this view, she conveyed him to the island of Skyros, in the Aegean Sea, where, disguised as a girl, he was brought up among the daughters of Lycomedes, king of the country. Now that the presence of Achilles was required, owing to an oracular prediction that Troy could not be taken without him, Menelaus consulted Calchas, the soothsayer, who revealed to him the place of his concealment. Odysseus was accordingly dispatched to Skyros, where, 
by means of a clever device, he soon discovered which among the maidens was the object of his search. Disguising himself as a merchant, Odysseus obtained an introduction to the royal palace, where he offered to the king's daughters various trinkets for sale. The girls, with one exception, all examined his wares with unfeigned interest. Observing this circumstance, Odysseus shrewdly concluded that the one who held aloof must be none other than the young Achilles himself. But in order further to test the correctness of his deduction, he now exhibited a beautiful set of warlike accoutrements, whilst, at a given signal, stirring strains of martial music were heard outside, whereupon Achilles, fired with warlike ardour, seized the weapons, and thus revealed his identity. He now joined the cause of the Greeks, accompanied at the request of his father by his kinsman Patroclus, and contributed to the expedition a large force of the Salian troops, or Myrmidons, as they were called, and also fifty ships. For ten long years Agamemnon and the other chiefs devoted all their energy and means in preparing for the expedition against Troy. But during these warlike preparations, an attempt at a peaceful solution of the difficulty was not neglected. An embassy consisting of Menelaus, Odysseus, etc., was dispatched to King Priam, demanding the surrender of Helen. But though the embassy was received with the utmost pomp and ceremony, the demand was nevertheless rejected, upon which the ambassadors returned to Greece, and the order was given for the fleet to assemble at Aulis in Boeotia. Never before in the annals of Greece had so large an army been collected. A hundred thousand warriors were assembled at Aulis, and in its bay floated over a thousand ships, ready to convey them to the Trojan coast. The command of this mighty host was entrusted to Agamemnon, king of Argos, the most powerful of all the Greek princes. Before the fleet set sail, solemn sacrifices were offered to the gods on the seashore, when suddenly a serpent was seen to ascend a plane tree, in which was a sparrow's nest, containing nine young ones. 